So welcome again to a new episode of the John Q Podcast, where we talk about everything related to pickleball, gear, technology, current events, mostly paddles, though. That's our, that's our shtick. Love paddles, man. <sighs> we love paddles. Yeah. Uh, Eddie, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, John. Yeah. You're tired? Tired. You, you, uh, you worked hard today. <laughs> you worked hard and played hard. <laughs> did, uh, did some skinny singles with you, mm-hmm. played some men's doubles after that, and... Rode my bike here to your place. That's so. right. It's been it's been, been a big on day. the move for about six hours now. And here we go again for another hour and a half. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Anything fun happened to you over the past week? Nope. No. Okay. <laughs> Just same old, same old. Got nothing. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Nothing big in my life. Although there is a a new interview. So a gentleman named Matthew Schwartz. Uh, wrote a, an article. He interviewed me and wrote an article. He writes for HUDEF, uh, the paddle company, at least their web, web page. And he uh, is an, a retired writer. So he's a real talent when it comes to writing. He did a piece on Chris Olson a few weeks ago, mm. uh, reached out to me and sent me several questions. We traded emails back and forth. It wasn't a live interview. And he wrote up the article uh and it's really well done uh so it's it's uncomfortable for me to to see like personal stuff uh, for myself online you know uh but but there's some stuff in there that uh you know isn't widely known so you know my my drumming background my academic background uh some stuff from my, our family and that sort of thing so uh, yeah uh, well done matt appreciate you know the the talent you bring to this space uh it's good to see you know Different people with different talents come into, in, into pickleball. And as a retired writer, um, I think it's just it's neat to see that. Any connection with Hudef or is that just the, the folks that are posting the interview? They're just posting it. He's He writes for them on the regs, and, and they recognized his talent. I don't know how they found him. Uh, he and I had traded emails before he started writing for, for Hudef. So, so he reached out to me through my website, I think, and, and yeah. Good on UDEF to find good talent. So uh, I'll put a link to that article in the description. You ever do any writing in your career or personally? Uh, not like fiction, but but I, so much writing for, for archaeology. You know, it's just report after report after report and publication. And yeah. so lots of technical writing. And one thing I noticed going back and forth between, well, moving into the pickleball space, I'm writing scripts for videos and I, you have to make them, you know, as spoken word. And I had a hard time doing that originally because I was so technical in my writing. And now going back into archaeology after doing a lot of these <laughs> video scripts, I'm, I'm getting very casual with my archaeology writing. I have to, to tighten it up a little bit. How about you, Eddie? Do you do any writing? Yeah, I've done uh, quite a bit throughout my career. I used to work for this organization called the Consumer Product Safety Commission. It's a federal agency and they look over product safety and things like that. So my first job there was as a writer of this newsletter. It's called The Safety Review. And it was all about product safety and recent recalls and mm-hmm. what uh, consumers could do about, you know, just making their homes and businesses safer. And um, those newsletters, this was a little bit pre-internet, but those newsletters were all over like doctor's offices and schools. And I think we had a circulation of about 300,000 at Jeez. the time. So that was a a big job for me at the time. Yeah, so just public schools, institutions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, any place that uh, you know where health of people was prominent. Uh-huh. I would say. Yeah. Did you write those the posters we had to hang up in businesses? And- I've done that too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Those press releases. Uh huh. Okay. Um, I did a bunch. There was this whole thing way back when about um, you know paint on toys coming from China, how they were tainted with lead. And so mm-hmm. we were doing so many product recalls. I remember recalling my son's favorite Thomas the Tank Engine oh, no. uh, at the time. And uh, <laughs> that was un- an unfortunate press release that I had to write there. So. Yeah. Did you get to put your name on it or is it anonymous? Right. Uh, I think my name was on, on a couple of them just as a, a media point of contact okay. um, should they have any questions or gotcha. want to do an interview, something That's like that. That's interesting. I learn more about you every week, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> None of it good. <laughs> well, should we move on to, yeah. to current news? I know you just told me right before the podcast you didn't watch much of the PPA tournament in North Carolina. Last week? Yeah, there's so much basketball going on. It's hard to oh, squeeze okay. another sport that, at the that's moment. Where, that's where your attention – I mean, they ask a lot, right? You know, 
four days in a row, 12 hours a day. <laughs> it's hard to keep up. <laughs> but um, How about you? Did you watch any of the tournament? I did. I, I, I dropped in occasionally and, and watched some of the, the main matches. Um, so big news, uh, Ben Johns and Annalie Waters are back on the triple gold, both of them triple crowned uh, this weekend. And Lee, this is her 100th uh, gold Annalie, medal yep. in the PPA, which begs the question, will Paddle Tech make a Annalie Waters 100 gold medal commemorative paddle? Like for $1,000. <laughs> for $1,000. <laughs> 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 God, I hope not, because I, I feel compelled to buy it at this right. point. Maybe they'll, they'll, they won't charge quite $100. So before I lived in Colorado, I lived in that area of North Carolina. So it's really cool to see pickleball mm-hmm. flourish there. It's um, It started small when I was there, and it grew exponentially. Um, but my friend, Lane Etheridge, owns a, an indoor pickleball facility there, and he got to be the hitting partner with Anna Lee this week. So oh, that nice. was kind of cool for him to be able to be – you know, so intimate with her. And shout out to Lane. Yeah. Yeah. Did he have like bruises all over his <laughs> I'm chest sure. getting Tag. body bagged? <laughs> <laughs> you tagged me pretty good the other day, John. Right, <laughs> oh, in, God, the, right in the neck. Right I feel in the so neck. bad about that. <laughs> that, that. That'll lead us to our one of our questions, our, our Q&A at the end of the show. So Is it about that. neck protectors? Uh, no, but, but you could segue into that okay. if you wanted to. It's my new product coming out. <laughs> yeah, but uh, for the PBA, there are some interesting... Um, matchups. I mean, Ben and Annalie won everything as usual, but um, so the gold medal match for men's doubles was um, was the Johns brothers versus Guh and Martinez Vic. That's cool. Yeah, super cool. So good to see Jaume and, and, and Augie Guh uh, make it so far. I mean, finals week for doubles. Jaume's everywhere these days. He's yeah. just so athletic, so good. And there's such a high ceiling on that character. But yeah, for We've Augie. We've been talking about Guh now for yeah. probably four or five weeks. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they lost in, in three, you know, uh, but it was still competitive. It was not like they got bulldozed by the Johns brothers. But yeah, another cool matchup were for the women's devils, uh, Annalie Waters, Catherine P- Parento versus Vivian David and Lacey Schneeman uh, in the finals. So good to see Vivian. Is that a new partnership? They I played like before. That, I, I saw them okay. play. They played together in, in Denver, PPA, I think, last year in July. Uh, but, but yeah, good on them. Uh, they played exceptional. Uh, and then finally, uh, for mixed doubles, it was Anley Waters and Ben Johns, obviously, versus Tina Pisnick and Deco Barr. And I think, I mean, that's not a new partnership, but that's, that's for sure as far as, as they've gone to, to finals yeah. Sunday. Man, Tina Pisnick is just such, so consistent. I mean, she's always getting balls back. She's such a good resetter and, and cross court dinks all day long. She's not missing. A single one. She, she's just so consistent. Such a good player. And Seems like she was nowhere six months ago. R- right. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's really. But that's pickleball. Yeah. And I think she's 42, I think. So, you know, and that's great that, that people in their 40s can, can play finals Sunday and the PPA, you know. I'm waiting for a uh, 55 plus 5, 8 and under Asian male league to start up. <laughs> I think you I have a shot. It. <laughs> I think I have a shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sad that we're both we'd be considered senior pros if we made it that far. Yeah. You're a lot closer to that than I am, but, Thanks. but yeah. Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah. Tina Pisnik just setting Deckel up all the time, and he's just able to take over the court when he wants, and and uh, so aggressive. And so Deckel's just playing great out of his mind these days. Yeah, that was good times. I I didn't watch a bunch of it, but definitely tuned in on. Um, semifinals and, and championship Sunday as and well. And your basketball teams make it through? I don't follow basketball. Mm, not there? No, no. Although it's fun to watch. I, I did go to the Nuggets game uh, when when a gentleman from, uh, that owns a pickleball company, he's actually a referee uh, and uh, starting a, a company called Synergy, uh, invited me to the game. And, and it reminded me how how exciting uh, it is to watch oh, professional lot of basketball. Are amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So how about you? Well, I was happy for NC State. They did really well. Mm -hmm. I think they went further than uh, expected, of course. But uh, great to see the Carolina teams do well, especially NC State. When you see UNC and Duke, it's kind of at the top every year. Yeah. Nice to see another one break through once in a while. 
Yeah, nice. I love the ACC. Yeah, so I grew up, uh, you know, Maryland Terrapins fan. They were in the ACC at the time, and mm-hmm. it was so many fun years of just battles with NC State, Duke, Virginia, mm-hmm. North Carolina. Uh, just year after year, great basketball. That's great. It's great you still follow the rivalry. Here and there. Well, excellent. Um, next topic, latest news, <laughs> gear gossip, that sort of stuff. So I think the biggest story, and I'm pretty sure that Pickleball Studio covered this as well, but uh, Christian Alshon blowing up the internet with his tweets. Did you get a chance to to read what he wrote? It was April Fool's, so my <laughs> thought was this is a joke. <laughs> right? And I think a lot of other people shared that, but then he, he doubled down, and it's pretty clear that he was, he was just baiting people. So know. if I recall, the tweet was something along the lines of, Pickleballs made me a great athlete, mm-hmm. you know, way more than tennis. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Something paraphrasing, right? Is that yeah. right? Yeah, okay. exactly. He said, uh, you know, it's made him a better athlete, and and it requires more skill. Something about you know being eight feet away, seven yeah. feet away from your opponent, reaction time, reaction time, that sort of thing. And if you just stop short of saying <laughs> compared to tennis. <laughs> Why open that? Uh, it got 1.4 <laughs> million views as of today, okay. so it, it's quite the popular tweet, or at least infamous t- tweet. Uh, Nick Curios actually uh, responded. Uh, he wrote something. I mean, it was, he was kind to of pickleball, but he was like, come on, Christian. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not as athletic as tennis. Basically, he said— So do you agree with that, John, that it's not as athletic as tennis? For sure. I'll put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. Pickleball's not as athletic as tennis. If you look at the top 100 tennis players, it requires a level of athleticism that, that pickleball does not require. Um, you know, I not not casting any shade on Christian Alshon. He's hugely athletic. Or any of the other top pros. Most of them are, are very athletic. But there's, a, there's an aspect of pickleball that, you know, that allows – people who are not as athletic to play competitively, and that's why it's so popular and so fun. But could that just be where pickleball is? I mean, it's still in its infancy. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, <laughs> we talked about it last week, burn a hell of a lot of calories. I don't know where it stands compared to tennis, but um, right. it certainly is an athletic endeavor. I, I can't compare it to tennis because I never played tennis, right? so I won't even go there. But um, Yeah, you know, I think, I think tennis requires – higher levels of strength and accuracy, uh, maybe not accuracy, but it's definitely strength than, than tennis. So, and it's going to select for the top players being very tall and strong, right? <laughs> Biggest servers. The serve is one of the most important plays in the game. And similar to how NBA selects for people seven feet tall and above, right? Again, maybe we see that in pickleball in the years to come, that only the, the biggest and strongest are successful in the sport. Yeah. I, I don't think we're seeing necessarily um, the world's best athletes mm-hmm. um, going into tennis or into pickleball from a very young age. Right. That's that's the key. Uh, that's the point I was going to bring up. Is yeah, it is in a bit. It's infancy, and what we're seeing right now is it's kind of like MMA when it first started. You, you throw all these different martial arts together, and it it became known pretty quickly that. Brazilian jiu-jitsu was kind of the best at that point. But you were getting to see all of these these different martial artists fight and do pretty well together. And and it was – there was in no way at that point is it – was it at all similar as it is today, you know? Yes, there were arm bars and, and headlocks and those sorts of things. But today it's become its own thing. And anybody who fought back in UFC 1 through 50 would get annihilated in – current by current standards because it's progressed so far and people weren't as athletic same for tennis <laughs> tennis has been around forever the early few decades of tennis did not attract the the biggest athletes so i think you're you're right and and that yes pickleball is much younger but i do think that given the smaller court size it takes more finesse so it's not going to select for the strongest players or but definitely definitely the players with the highest levels of uh, response time, like your reaction time has to be yeah. on point. I think right. that's one of the points that – even though he was trolling for sure, Christian Alshon, you know, I think it, it is a good point that, yes, you're getting sped up on from 10 feet away when you account for reaching into the kitchen, right? And you've got to be able to react to that. 
very quickly, and you, you don't see that as much in tennis. Well, <laughs> bad news is good for publicity, so <laughs> in this case, it certainly helped his numbers. Andy Roddick also jumped in um, and, you know, obviously provided a counterpoint. All Sean came back that Nick, I mean, he was kind to Nick. Nick was kind to pickleball in general. I think his final point was, yeah, it's a, it's a fun game, but come on, don't be silly. But <laughs> All Sean challenged them. He said, okay, I'll give you six months to practice pickleball. Come and challenge me for 100K or whatever, and I'll, I'll donate it to charity, right? And the counterpoint, the, the retort, of course, was, well, that's not really fair. How about we, we train for six months in pickleball, you train for six months in tennis, and let's see who does better in their respective sports. It's obvious that all Sean's going to have a harder time getting into the top 10, for example, in tennis oh, yeah. as tennis players, pro tennis players would in pickleball. But again, much smaller pool you're dealing with than pickleball. It's, yep. a, it's a newer sport. We're, n- we're not dealing with something, an institution that's been around for decades and decades, right? Interesting yeah. argument. Yeah, I, I do think that we will see the level of, of athleticism only increase from here on out. And in who knows, whatever number you want to throw out there, five, ten years, mm-hmm. you're going to look back and say, man, those those guys were nothing compared to where we are today. Yeah, you know, you know one of the... One of the predictions I keep hearing about is it, you're going to see a lot of really tall players come into pickleball because they can reach into the kitchen and right. flick those dinks out of the air. Yep. It hasn't happened yet. The taller players are good. There are some really good taller players, but they don't seem to have any advantage necessarily overall compared to players of all sizes. Mm. It'll be interesting to see if that is a trend that, act, trend that actually happens. I haven't seen it yet, though. I still want to start my league because <laughs> I'm nowhere near touching the net from the kitchen line. <laughs> good, good. Well, let's move on to the meat of our podcast this week. So we are in, what, week three now? We are paddle in week bracket three challenge. of our challenge. That's excellent. So we'll give a rundown after we talk about the paddles that we played with today to give kind of a running tally of the top scoring paddles that we've hit with. But this week we chose four paddles. We have we get we're getting the wide bodies into the <laughs> into the, the big boys. Yeah, and onto the court this week. So we've got the Electrum Pro Stealth, which is an edgeless wide body paddle. We have the I've got them all over here. Okay. We've got the Groovin Moving 16S, which is standard size, so 16 by 8, but it's got the longer handle. Mm-hmm. Volaire Mach 2 Forza, another Popular paddle that, that I gave a good review to. Uh, it's a wide body paddle. And then since Engage has come out with a new paddle, I thought we'd throw that into the mix this week. So we are looking at the Engage Pro 1, both the 6.0, which is 16 millimeter, and the 14 millimeter versions of that paddle. Eddie, do you, which one do you want to start with? Well, before we do that, do you want to recap kind of where we are at this point? We've been at this, uh, this is our third week, right? So we've got That's two right. weeks of data That's right. that we've already compiled. Uh, and just to refresh, folks, we're taking the top eight. Eight or 16. <laughs> eight or 16. We haven't decided. Well, we better figure that out pretty quickly. <laughs> right. Let's say eight after our uh, preliminary evaluation, which we're going to wrap up here in the next probably two weeks or so, mm-hmm. come up with our top number. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we'll have some head-to-head competitions to see which ones come out on top. Right. Um, so far, we've looked at what's the number, John? Nine. Fourteen, including this week. Fourteen. And we're rating them on a scale of one to five for power, pop, spin, control, and sweet spot. Mm-hmm. And a little extra bonus score we're calling the X factor uh, for another possible five points. Right. Um, so we definitely have some. Paddles that are sort of floating to the top mm-hmm. and others that are sinking to the bottom. Correct. All right. Let's get into this week's paddles. So we started with – I started with the Electrum Pro Stealth today. So so let's give that one a go first. All right. So, again, this is a square paddle, uh, extra wide, so it fits into – it's wider than eight inches wide, so it fits into One of those things that they serve pizza on in the <laughs> – It does yeah. look like that. <laughs> A <laughs> uh, big spatula. Um, and very thin. I think it's 11 mil- millimeters thin. Edgeless, super, super light swing weight and light lightweight overall. The handle is on the smallish side. Uh, I mean, you could 
you can fit two hands on for a 2E if you really squeeze them together. I did put lead tape, so this is uh, the heavier lead tape, three grams per inch, and this looks like three to four inches at the four and eight o'clock positions just to stabilize it. I would not. I would not recommend playing this paddle without perimeter weight. It is so I lightweight. Can't even there's, imagine. there's no, yeah, no lateral stability without weight and no power at all. I mean, the static weight has is probably nothing. It's yeah. I know the swing weight's got to be in it's the like low under 90s. 100. I think yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's a weird paddle, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, of th there are three shapes for these um, Stealth series, which are their new edgeless ones. And yes, it's weird. I think this one is my favorite of th the three. I don't play the best with it because I'm not used to such a short paddle. But I, I think this one has the most potential. So that's, that's why I threw it in with uh, what we're doing today. So what did you think of the spin for this Electrum? Spin was Average. Yeah. I gave it a three. Nothing nothing extreme. Yeah. It's it's raw carbon fiber, so it's going to hit like most other raw carbon fiber paddles. Electrum does pretty well with their peel plies on their raw carbon fiber. They generally – I think they tend to last a little longer. I trust okay. Electrum's grit more than others not to wear down. And it's the same as their other, all the other Electrum raw carbon fiber paddles. So it gets – good spin. I gave it a four for spin. How about for, for power? Power was, I mean, understandably so, given its dimensions and metrics. Um, it's on the low side. I give it a two. I mean, that's not... Uh, there's room for this paddle in the world mm -hmm. because um, I, I didn't hit any balls out yeah. today with that paddle. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I did. <laughs> I could not get that thing dialed in, but but I gave it a one for power. It, it just feels like hitting the ball with a paper plate at the baseline. And, and again, power is full swings, yeah. serves, drives, overhead slams, that sort of thing. I couldn't generate the power that I wanted with it, which is, that's okay. It's, it's just not a power paddle. Right. It's very much the opposite. I'm guessing same for pop. Or something close to it. For pop, I got a three. So okay. just because it's it's so lightweight, the swing weight's so light, and it's such a short paddle, it's very maneuverable. You can really get from zero to 100 very quickly. This is true. Yeah. How about you? I'm what? a two for pop. Two for pop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sweet spot? Sweet spot? I was hoping that with the, the size and the width of this paddle, it would be more than it is. It just doesn't have any weight behind it, I think, to, to give it a, an enlarged sweet spot. So I'm at a two. Okay, I gave it a three. Yeah, I agree. You could you could certainly feel when you hit it off center, the, the twisting in your hands. There's some lateral instability. And again, I tried to short that up with, with lead tape, which helped a ton. I would say so. I think it needs more. I have half an ounce total on it right now. There's just not enough there. I mean, if you are if you hit it on one side of the paddle, there's just not enough weight on the other mm -hmm. side to counteract yeah. that activity. Yeah, so sweet spot three. And control was three for me too. Control's at a three. Okay. Yeah, I mean, given its poppiness, and it's more poppy than it is powerful. That poppiness combined with the smallish sweet spot lateral instability, it's just kind of middle of the road for me for for control. Yeah. Any X factor points? I actually gave it a couple because yeah, nice. I, I thought it played pretty well for what it is. I uh -huh. think there's, uh, like I said, room for it in the marketplace for somebody looking for that just crazy lightweight, low swing weight mm -hmm. weapon, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it's okay. I, I like the it. edgeless design. I think it looks sharp. Yeah. The graphics are cool. Cool. Yeah. How about you? I like it. I gave it a zero. Okay, right that's there, fine. So, so um, largely it's because I think – so I gave it a good review. I, gave, I put it in my end of 2023 paddles for the lightweight category. I think it was my number one, okay. number one or two. And the reason I, I put all of these Electrum um, Stealth models in – because they're like blank slates, and uh, you would not want to use these again without perimeter weighting, lead, or, or, or tungsten tape. And I just think it's given that they're, they're all kind of the lightest weight paddles and the lightest swing weight paddles, that's something. So that impressed me, and they play okay, I think. You know, they don't play poorly. They take off all the boxes, so I, I did give them a good rating in that end of year. And I think what happened is that I played with them again today, and I just they just or this one just didn't feel as good as I remembered it. And I think it's because some other wide body paddles have come around, like the Mach Two Forza, that just hit much better than than this, and they're in a better stock state. And that's not to say that if you want the lightest paddle on the market, this isn't a good choice because it is. But you know, if if you want 
a paddle that's more suitable for most people to play with, that's easier to hit with out of the box, then there are better options for the wide, wide, You wide know, you say category. blank slate, and that kind of brings me to a thought. I, I wonder what would happen if you just wrapped this whole thing in tape. Yeah, we should try it. I mean, honestly, and, if there I mean, there's plenty of room to work with, right? <laughs> if there were any paddle to do that with, it would be <laughs> this one. Maybe two strips around the entire perimeter. Yeah, Stack let's them do up. it. Yeah. That'll be fun. <laughs> So okay. that's interesting. We both came up with a score of 14. Oh, 14 for you too. That's yep. right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, not our highest scoring paddle, but, you know, let's move on to the next one. The Groovin Movin 16S. Okay. So this, I think this falls within the standard dimensions, not wide body. So 16 inches long by eight inches wide. Uh, but it, one of the things that stands out is the longer handle. So it's got a I five do like point, that. Yeah, 5.5 inch handle, which is very easy to get both hands on. Uh, and yeah, just kind of a unique shape, a little bit of a, again, the lollipop. You like the shape? Shape. I mean, I like the fact that it hits much harder than it looks like it's going to hit. <laughs> You're like, oh, this is a cutesy paddle, but <laughs> don't underestimate its power or pop. So Eddie, what did you give it for spin? Spin, I'm at a four. So spin for me, I... I you know, I, I I was expecting a little more, honestly, okay. so I gave it a three. And that's I did spin test on this. I got, you know, probably top tier, just under. I, I want to say, if I remember correctly, 1,900 to 2,000. But <laughs> I, I feel like we've hit a new threshold in, in peel ply. Maybe it's just because people are ignoring the stare-at rules and they're just like, screw it. I'm going to put this paddle out mm-hmm. on the market for people to buy, and it's going to be over the, you know, the R, RZ limits. But I just wasn't able to shape the ball. And you can, and it's, again, this is not just a placebo effect, but it feels very fine uh, that when you feel, when your fingers across it. I'm pretty sure it is the legacy, uh, the legacy peel ply, which is the finer peel ply. And just my, whatever it is about my mechanics hitting the ball, I can't get it as much spin. So I noticed the ball wasn't shaping as much as I wanted it to hitting it today. So that's you know, it's I, one of those things where they, you know, the sum of the parts, and I gave it an X factor point here because of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the way everything comes together helps me with the spin. I, I felt like I was able to, it works well with my my swing style, Right, I would say. That's a really interesting topic we should get into for another podcast is, is what... What does a proper top spin f- stroke look like? Forehand, backhand, dink, whatever. Uh, you and I have very different strokes. Like your, yours comes up, your hand goes straight up in the air, and I'm more kind of wristy. And, and You're mine, very wristy. Yeah, mine comes across my body more than, than yours. So so you get – I notice you get a lot of spin on, on some paddles that I cannot get as much spin on and vice versa, right? So I agree. Yeah, that would be a, a cool topic. And this one works for me for some reason. Yeah. All right. Well, power. What would you give the groove and moving? Power and pop. I'm, I'm at a three for both. Okay. Nothing overwhelming. I couldn't put it past you with power. Mm-hmm. But there's – there's enough there where you're in the game. Yeah, I, I went straight from the Electrum Pro Stealth to the Groovin Movin. <laughs> it feels great. And I hit it? like 30 balls out. <laughs> <laughs> I could not keep him in the court with this paddle at first. And, and it was just because, you know, I was used to swinging for the fences with the Pro Stealth. Uh, this one. I think you probably should not have started today with the Electrum. Uh, yeah, I should have. You were very consistently six inches out. <laughs> you had, I had to back back up ten feet out from the baseline to serve. That's how. At least that's you have ten feet to work with in some courts. Her, don't. Right, that's true. That's true. But yeah, I gave power a three on this and pop a four. Notable jump in in both of these, particularly the power over the Electrum. And yeah, again, it doesn't doesn't look like a powerful paddle, but it 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 hits harder than it looks for sure. Yeah. Sweet spot, I gave it a four. How about you? Four as well, and and for me, that contributes to the control aspect as well, and I Mm -hmm. gave that a four. I gave control a three just because it is poppier than you would expect kind of this shape paddle to be, which is a good thing at the kitchen for offensive options, but it also led to more pop-ups for me uh, today. And it's certainly – you can certainly dial it in. You can get used to it, and it can be a good control paddle. But I I feel like I would – probably classify this more as an all-court paddle leaning toward the control side of the spectrum rather than a pure control paddle. you said all-court. I thought you said awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a little awkward. I was playing awkward today, but <laughs> that was my fault, not the paddle's fault. But, but yeah, I think it's more of an all-court paddle. There it, are some paddles, uh, and not, I mean, I, 
I can control some paddles with that have a softer feel. Mm -hmm. But there are some paddles where I actually control it better when it's a hard playing paddle. And this is a hard paddle, right? Yeah. It's, it, it's got that very crisp. sort of classic thermoform Gen 2 feel. Yeah. Um, and it, it comes together for me for control. Okay. Interesting. I like it. We're getting some different scores this week. We're not... Not really. In line Our total other. scores are pretty much in line <laughs> right. with this again. How about X Factor? I already gave uh, my thoughts on that with a one. How about you? I gave it a one also. And uh, it's for me, it was more, I mean, it's not the design. The, sh the, the shape design is pretty cool. You know, the, the longer handle, the different shape. I mean, kudos to Groovin uh, to coming out with all of their paddles are unique shapes, right? They, they don't really follow the typical molds that everybody else follows, and I appreciate that. But just the fact that, it, again, it, it looks like a cutesy paddle, but it hits much harder than it looks and has very much some offensive options. Yeah, yeah. I gave it a I give it a X factor point. Honestly, I don't care for the shape. I think it's not one that I gravitate to naturally. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I do appreciate about the shape is that it's – it makes it obvious when it's a round paddle head where the sweet spot is. And in this case, the physical dimensions of the center of the paddle is where the sweet spot is. So you don't have to really think about right. you know, where the sweet spot is. Is it high? Is it low on the paddle face? Mm -hmm. It's right in the middle of that lollipop. That's true. So okay. I am at a 19. 18 for me. And you're at 18. Yeah. So once again, we're within one. Yep. Go figure. All right. Uh, brings us to the Volier Mach 2 Forza. Ooh, baby. Yeah. I guess. So I gave it a great review early this year, and my memory served me well. It played exceptional again uh, while I was playing with it today. So, Eddie, how about spin, power, and pop? What did you give it for those three metrics? Spin, four, power, and pop, three each. Okay. I gave it a, the top score, five, for spin. Uh, I can... I can get a lot of spin off of this. Uh, it actually it came in, I think for a while it was number one on my spin testing, mm. you know, just by a couple of RPMs and not anything significant above person below it, but it's twenty over 2,300 RPM is what I was getting with this paddle, which is top, top tier. And that was the same today. I was shaping the ball just as I would expect with that high RPM. Power, I give it only a two. You know, it's got... Decent power. I didn't feel like it was quite as hot as the Groove and Move in 16S. You know, it's just that paddle just continually impresses me in terms of his power. I felt the like they were about on par with each other. Okay. And pop, I gave it a three. So yep. it got more pop than, than power. And You know, I this today was the first time I ever touched a Volaire paddle. Really? Um, in, all, in all your positive reviews of uh -huh. it and everybody else's, really. Right. Uh, it's something that I've always wanted to do. It just never came up. And, mm -hmm. man, was I impressed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the the combination of this extra long handle. I think I think it's maybe advertised as five point five, but it's it's longer. You know, the paddle, the the handle links um, are always kind of wonky. It's, there's no standardized way to measure it. You know, where it goes up. Usually they measure it to the top of the stock grip, yeah. and that's usually going to give you more room to work with on top of that. So it feels like a six inch handle to me, or at least a five point seven five inch handle. You and I were talking a little bit about the shape of it, and it's. So very similar to the Scorpius shape uh, of Yola. It is. It's, it's a different kind of paddle. Right. It's a little bit wider and uh, longer, l wider than the Scorpius. It, it's, it's, the Scorpius is a standard 16 by 8. This was a little bit shorter than 16 and a little bit wider than 8 yeah. and the longer handle. But, yeah, yeah I'd say they, they, they play pretty similar. This That little subtle difference, though, makes – Makes a difference in the lateral size, uh, the lateral sweet spot. The sweet spot on this feels amazing to oh, me. Oh, man. I I gave it a five on sweet spot. Me too. Yeah. I can't think of another paddle, in, at least in recent memory, of all-time memory for me, that has there, where there's a bigger sweet spot. Yeah. You? No. And, again, it's lateral sweet spot, yeah. which correlates with the twist, twist weight because it's so wide. It's got this lateral stability. Yeah, so... You know, you do feel it twisting if you hit it way off center. It's just got so much real estate there right to left. Right. But, but unlike the Electrum, there's weight there to there's weight there. sort of back it up. Yeah. It's not going to die entirely. It's just a little bit of twisting in your hands. And we're playing with this stock without lead or tungsten or anything. So I don't know if it needs it. Yeah. I put some on for the review and I took it off. I didn't, didn't think it needed it either. I, I, I like the quick hand speed that it affords, you know, being shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, and again – 
huge sweet spot. Uh, control for me overall was a four. Same. Okay. Yep. That, that sweet spot combined with the kind of the muted pop. I mean, pop's there if you need it, but it, it's kind of the perfect balance yeah. where it's not too poppy that you're just going to pop up balls unnecessarily. And the spin and the sweet spot, all of those create a really good control paddle. There were a couple times when I, I did miss having that extra half inch um, or more in Lane. some cases. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. It takes a while to dial it in. I remember the, I played with it for two weeks. And the first few games over over the course of two days of games, I was shanking, you know, every so tenth weird. ball off the top. And then you get dialed in. You just learn where the paddle goes to, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all that muscle memory you build up playing with elongated paddles. You got to adjust. I think those. I missed two or three in our in our just mini skinny singles game, mm-hmm. just right off the edge, or yep, just a miss altogether. So again, wide sweet spot. It's got a, a decent sized sweet spot north to south also, lengthwise, but it's just a shorter paddle. You're going to have to, if you're used to a longer paddle, you're going to have to adjust. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's a huge adjustment. No. Okay. Uh, do you have any X Factor points for it? I gave it one. I've Just the overall feel of it is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a great feeling paddle. I, for me, it's sweet spot all day long. Yeah. I mean, tell me you have the biggest sweet spot and prove it, and I'm probably going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I give it two uh, X Factor points because I, f- I feel like it's the first wide body paddle with a long handle. Yeah, that's a great point. On the market. And they really kind of innovated in that aspect. And uh, a lot of people are, are trying to, or will be copying that paddle because it is pretty popular. And a lot of people are realizing, oh, this thing plays like a dream. I don't have to be quite as precise. Yep. And yeah. One of our higher higher scoring paddles. Yeah. What did you? What was your total score for it? I'm at a twenty. You're a twenty-one. Twenty-one for me. Yeah. It's for forty-one total points, and that is um, right near the top. And that brings us to our new Engage paddle. So Engage recently sent me most of their entire older stock of paddles, and we've been playing around with those. We actually talked about one of those on mm-hmm. week one. Week one, and uh, the new Pro ones are out for pre-order. I think starting this weekend, you can actually purchase them on Pickleball Central. Oh, and by the way, I haven't mentioned this yet to anybody, but I do have a Pickleball Central code now for 10% off uh, Pickleball Central. I think it's 10%. Uh, so That's it's cool. John Q. <laughs> just the, the same the as all my other code. Yeah, the, the whole website except for, again, I think um, I think Selkirk and Gearbox, Gearbox. Uh, are the two companies that you can't use discount codes on, just the same as any other retail shop. But, yeah, I mean, I, I figured they're such a big warehouse of – pickleball gear that if you need shoes or socks or you know whatever even besides paddles i have most mostly i deal directly with companies for paddles Mm -hmm. but yeah if you want any pickleball gear you can use the code at pickleball i will say they have an excellent selection of shoes i bought a lot of shoes from pickleball central they they stock the sizes that i need which aren't typical yeah, I used to buy all my shoes from Frailmouth and had, back when Pickleball Central had less shoes selection than Frailmouth, but now I, I noticed that too. They do have a good selection. And, and not to go on too much about Pickleball Central, but they have a really nice matrix of all their shoes that includes the width of the shoe. And I have not been able to find that resource anywhere else. I didn't realize that. Um, so it's fantastic. If you, if you need a narrower sh- shoe or a wider one, uh, that's for me, a real nice reference to have. Yeah, really cool. Thank I didn't you, realize Pickleball that. Central. All right, so this Engage Pursuit Pro 1 comes in two models, so the 16 and 14 millimeter thickness. They're all the same shape. And they sent me, I don't know if this is going to be the case for their production models, but they sent me a heavy and a light version of each of these. All right. So the heavy is right at 8 8.0 static weight ounces, and the light is around 7.7 for, for for both of these. And that's the way they're selling them, as lightweight and heavyweight? That's what I'm not sure about. Okay. Uh, probably, but I'll have to check, double-check and verify that on their website. So one of the cool things, a um, couple of cool things about these new paddles, one is the at least the 60 millimeter comes with a matte edge guard. So one of the things I didn't like about the earlier models – of engage paddles were, were these shiny hard plastic edge guards. 
just kind of brought me back to, you know, a couple of years ago when the edge guards used to fall off. Not saying they do that on, on the engage paddles, but, but yeah, I just I think the mat looks better. It doesn't get scuffed up as easy. Yeah, just see that. Just an aesthetic thing for me. But also, no more exposed polymer in hey. the handle. <laughs> Such, such a great thing to have on, on for Engage it battles. Did feel good. That was one of the sticking points I had with, with Engage up to now is that each one of them, you could feel that polymer in the handle. It didn't used to bug me when I first started playing, but the, the, more, the more you think about it and the more you play with and, and hold really quality handle paddles, like these speed-up paddles, you know, with molded handles, oh, it's, it's night and day. So, this one here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that so, does feel good. Yeah, that's a really good handle. Anyway, as far as I can tell, these are still not thermoformed, which is <laughs> amazing because they hit like a truck. But uh, I did take the the wrap off, the stock wrap, and it looks like a piece of plastic that they put to cover the the polymer and, and, and the handle. And another good thing about this is that the handles are standardized with respect to the thickness of the paddle. So before, mm-hmm. if you got a 14-millimeter paddle, you got a thinner handle mm-hmm. and a 16-millimeter thicker handle. These are all 4.25-inch circumference handles, which are still – it feels a little bit thicker than 4.25 than the standard pickleball handle, but but thinner than all their other 16-millimeter handles, which I know a lot of people with smaller hands were, were not happy with the – looks good with the white overgrip. Yeah, so I put a, a white overgrip on this. So you and I played with – both of these today. Um, let's start with the 16 millimeter. So sure. This is a 16 mil. I played with the the lightweight uh, first, and I added a little bit of tungsten tape. So it looks like about a two inch strip, mm-hmm. at four and eight o'clock, uh, just to shore up some of that twisting. I really enjoyed this. I also enjoyed the heavier weight stock without the without the lead tape. But this is the one I was hitting with today. Um, Eddie, your thoughts on the spin and power and pop of this 16 mil? Well, I didn't notice any discernible difference between the heavyweight and the lightweight. Okay. But those three metrics were all excellent, particularly the power. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you, and I've said this before with paddles that tend to be higher on the swing weight scale, if you're patient and just let that paddle come around, let it do its job, mm-hmm. you can extract a lot of power. And with this one, like the other engages that we've played with recently, they're not hurting for power. That's, I, I give it a four. F- all right. For spin, I gave it a four. Same. Power, five. Okay. Yeah, you give it a four. Four. Yeah, I'd say these are getting up there close to gearbox level of power. I'm not quite there yet. And the way it, the reason I say that, I'd say that, that stock, these pedals hit about as hard as the – Previous models of Engages, the Engage Pros, the Pro Series, the square ones. Uh-huh. The difference is those things were like half an ounce to an ounce heavier right. stock than point. these. So whatever they did with the core, it did increase the power, and they're a mo- lot more palatable, I'd say, to most pickleball players who don't want an 8.5-ounce paddle stock. They prefer something eight ounces or below, and then if they want more weight, they can adjust and, and you know, add yep. tungsten tape if they want. Well, we're not doing decimals, so not doing decimals. I'm going with right. the four. <laughs> <laughs> and my goodness, the pop on this these paddles, I'd yep. say, is there's definitely a marked improvement in pop over the previous Engage Pros for me, and some of that's going to be related to the swing weight. You know, heavier yep. swing weights are harder to to, to get pop from. But also something about this core is, is is pretty wacky. It's it's for a non thermoform paddle, the core is powerful. It's pretty poppy. amazing. Yeah. What'd you give the pop? Pop it I'm at four. Okay. So same for pop. Uh, sweet spot. Sweet spot. Yeah, here's where I feel like it, it wasn't there for me. At least with this particular the sixteen millimeter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I felt there was a lot of twist in the paddle on just even slightly off center mm-hmm. strikes. Uh, so for sweet spot, I'm at a three. I'm at the same sweet spot, but it didn't feel as bad. It feel definitely feels better to me than the original Engage Pro line, the, the square ones. I didn't feel the dead spots in the top of the paddle like I did. I agree with that. Yeah. And, yeah, it's a little – the sweet spot's a little more elongated and, and narrow than, than thermoformed paddles of the same shape. So, again, the, the difference – 
and the shape here is that it has these are the first engage pedals to have a rounded top and not a total rectangle. Yeah. And those sharp angles that you get with this. It's previous. a good looking paddle. It's a good looking paddle. Shape, and it's say. very, very similar to most of the other curved top elongated paddles like the Apes Pro Lightning RGS, like the Rhombus R1, and a whole host of others that come in at 16.5 inches long with a curved top. So uh, the point of that is that it, the sweet spot is a little more elongated and narrow than you get, especially with the wide body paddles that we came from. So maybe yeah. maybe that was the reason why you're having an issue finding the sweet spot because you came And that from, was affecting my control as well. Yeah. On those slightly off-center shots, I felt like, you know, if, uh, if I'm swinging through and I miss high mm-hmm. on the paddle, then that, that trajectory was going to be high as well. Yeah. The return trajectory. For sure. So I was having some issues with control on that as well. So for that, I gave it a two. Two? Okay. I came in at three at control. I feel like overall for this level of power you're, this paddle's generating and the control is, is pretty decent. Yep. I was pretty impressed with it. Yep. And X Factor, I gave it a one. Same. I think that core is pretty cool. Whatever they're doing, their magic sauce is mm-hmm. working. That power is right. It's, it's there. It's accessible. Mm-hmm. It's controllable. Yeah. I like it. I do too. I just... I'd like to see one of these paddles that's either thermoformed or at least a Gen 1.5 with, with edge foam Yep. to spread out that sweet spot. I think, man, this paddle would be really killer if it had some edge foam in it. So 20 overall points for me. And I'm at, what am I at? 19. Okay. 18, excuse me. 18. I'm at 19 for the 14. I threw in a couple of extra points on sweet spot and control. Um, all of my other numbers being the same as the 16. But for the 14, I felt like there was some density there that was missing in the four, in the 16. And that gave me a little bit wider sweet spot, a lot more control. Uh, and so my score for that paddle is a 19. Interesting. Mine was also an overall score of 19, but that's down one for me compared to the 16. So I what's the difference in, in this versus the 16 for you? Yeah, I didn't play as well with it. And I had the opposite experience with... Uh, I guess the sweet spot felt about the same to me, but for for whatever reason, I wasn't the sixteen felt more balanced to me in terms of its power and pop. The, the pop on this is outrageous. The fourteen, like you get your hands on a counter and that thing's really coming back. Uh, didn't have quite as much power for me, so I gave it uh, four for power instead of the five that I gave the sixteen mil. I gave it a five for pop instead of the four that I gave the sixteen mil. Same sweet spot, so three for me. Uh, they can, one of the reasons why mine scored a little bit lower was a lower control score for me. So it's a two mm. control for me because of all the pop it generates. All right. I was popping things up. Another thing that we haven't talked about yet, and I want to go back and mention it for the Mach 2 Forza also, the angle that the ball comes off the paddle. Uh, this, one, these, this one felt a little higher to me than the 16 millimeter. Uh, So it's coming off, the trajectory is coming off a little bit higher, which was leading to a few more pop-ups. But one of the things I noticed is I really had to dial in, and I noticed this when I first reviewed the Volair Mach 2 Forza, that angle on the 16 millimeter in particular is really high. So the ball comes off. If you're used to serving with another paddle and you serve one ball with with the Mach 2 Forza, it's going to go four feet higher than Mm. you were expecting, at least in my experience. So I really had to... That's one of the reasons I was hitting a lot of balls out when you, you know, I first playing on the roof today. I really had to to close my paddle face and, and a lot compared to many other paddles. Did you notice that? Um, I didn't really notice that. Okay. I mean, I did notice a difference in launch angle between these two, the 14 and the 16 millimeter. Okay. Uh, but for me, that that I felt like the launch angle was a little bit more controllable. Okay. With the 14. So, we're very similar. Uh, yeah, 19s for both of us on the 14 millimeter. That's right. So, my winner today was the Volier Mach 2 Forza. Same. Okay. I'm a 20, you're a 21, total score of 41. Really an outstanding paddle. For sure. If that doesn't make it to our Elite Eight, I'd be surprised. I'd be very surprised. We do have some new releases. So, next week we'll be covering the new Yola Gen 3. Paddles. Can't wait. <laughs> so I've got the pro- we've got the prototypes, obviously, but we don't. I don't have the production models, which I know they're sending me this week. So right. we have some time to hit with those. I don't see them being any different. So it'll be fun to actually get to talk about these paddles. That what we've else been is on our with. plate for next week's 
review. Well, we're going to directly compare that to the Gearbox uh, Pro Power uh, elongated. It's our, it's our power conference next week. Our power conference, yeah. I mean, nice. We've got a couple more I can't quite recall, but but we've got our work cut out for us with just between those two pedals because there are you know, four models of the Yola Gen 3s. Mm. We've got the – well, actually, maybe five because we've got the <laughs> Perseus – 1614, right. we've got the Scorpius, Colin, Anna, 1614. Right. And then we've also got um, the Hyperion. Hyperion, thank you. The Ben and the Simone. Ben and Simone, yeah. <coughs> Simone is 14? I can't recall. I believe so. Okay. So maybe six of those. The Magnus? The Magnus, too. I keep forgetting about the Magnus. Seven of those. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> and, and we've got, what, two models of the Gearbox. No, three. Is there two or three of the Gearbox Pro? God, my brain's not working there's today. There's four. Is there four? I mean, there's there's two of the control and two of the power. Okay. That's right. Two of the control. But well, we'll focus won't on have the, all of those. We'll our, focus on the power. Yeah. For, so two of those. Anyway, got to so work it out for are, us next are, week. Are our numbers posted somewhere for people to check out, John? You mean our, our running yeah, tally? Right. Uh, not yet, but I did put a chart on the video last week, the podcast. Okay, perfect. Some some B-roll footage of, of that chart. I'll nice. do the same for this week. But we we do have a ranking here so far. So we've, we've done 14 paddles, and our top score right now is actually the Chorus Shapeshifter. All right. <laughs> We're coming in at 46, 46 points. Yeah. yeah but we've got a bunch to write in that, that sort of – yeah. Mid 40 ish range. And again, uh, you can go back to the first episode of, of this paddle bracket rally and learn more about the chorus shapeshifter. But it just, again, it just hits the ball where I wanted to hit it. Yeah. It's it's good at many things. Not not super exceptional in any one thing, but it's just the combination of everything makes it a really good paddle. 6 0 Black Diamond Infinity is number two at 42. At 42. Mm hmm. Hot on its heels is the 11624 Hirachi X at 41. Right. Tied with the Valer from today. That is – is it? Oh, I don't have the Valer in this, but yeah, you're, you're right. 41. It was 41, yeah. yeah. So we've got a tight grouping there. Tight grouping. So fun. I'm having fun with this. Yeah, me too. It's keeping us busy for that's, five, six weeks. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe too busy. Well, moving on then, we do have a winner – from last week, and um, I, I showed the chorus backpack and pair of safety glasses nice. uh, last week and, and offered that as a prize for the question that we chose to answer this week. And the backpack's kind of smallish. You can fit a couple of paddles in there, tons of nice pockets. So it's, it's a great just day bag when you want to just throw on a, a quick thing and mm-hmm. you got one paddle and a couple of balls and that's all you need. Right. And then the glasses are... Photochromic, so they darken up in the sun and lighten up so you can use them indoor, outdoor, without having to change your lenses, which is pretty cool. And, boy, I had a hard time selecting, again, this week. There are so many, so I've got a few questions we'll answer, but I think I'm going to give the gift, the number one gift, to Brian Banks, 3044, with the question, do you think they should make a rule that any ball that strikes a person above the chest or shoulder level should be a loss of a point or a serve to the person who hit it. Since the game is so fast now and power players think hitting harder is the secret to winning and now safety is a factor, mm. maybe some precautions should be made to keep the ball lower. So. Well, I, I appreciate the sentiment as someone who's been hit recently. <laughs> <laughs> right in the neck. <laughs> right in the neck. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> but, you know, I think the, um, the penalty of a point – or loss of serve or whatever mm-hmm. is probably too great. Yeah, um, there's just too many different play styles. Um, there's short people out there who's, frankly, their heads are not as high as other people's right. heads. Some people squat down to hit that. What does that call it? Tomahawk or mm-hmm. yeah. scorpion shot. Mm-hmm. I mean, and and penalizing them for being hit when they are purposefully bending over to have a strategic advantage. I think is right. Is probably too much. How yeah. about you? I totally agree. I think I think it's a great idea, and and you know, if the rule were to go into play, it would 
it would definitely be above the shoulders because the shoulder is a fair target, right? You hit somebody in the left or right shoulder, you chicken wing them. Like it's that's, something you practice. That's fair game. Yeah, for sure. But I'd say like if if we were to make the rule, it would definitely be like either neck and above or chin and above. Nobody wants to see anybody get hit in the face, and and you know unless the player is a maniac, they're not targeting the face. But yeah, I mean, an argu- argument could be made that yes, instituting that rule would make people hit the ball more cautiously, you know, when they're speeding up and be more precise with their speed ups because right now if you hit anybody anywhere, it's your point. So it kind of makes you a little bit looser with your speed ups. But it's just so when it comes to putting that theory to reality, it just doesn't work because like you said, like the the classic move, like even Deco Barr, he's 6'3", but he squats down just over the net when people are speeding up at him with that scorpion. At the ready, you and, do that. And yeah, I do that too. It's, it's a good, <laughs> it's a good move for somebody who's taller and a large target. But but yeah, I mean, if if you miss the ball and you're squatted that low, and and it's kind of deceptive too because you're standing up and you're waiting for that person to bend down, right. and then you squat. They don't yeah. know you're squatted down. They speed up, which would normally be right at your chest. Could hit you right in the face, and so it's not fair to to penalize the opponent for hitting somebody. In the face, as tragic as it as it is, if they're squatted down, or like you said, or if they're shorter. Shout out to Paula. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time we mentioned her on the podcast. But Eddie's partner, Paula. I mean, she she's able. One of the things about Paula's play that I admire so much is she can squat so low. Oh when I goodness. when I dink to her or, or speed it up or you know try to get it, and she's she's like <laughs> two inches from the ground, and she's able to get it back. So, but yeah, yeah, she's, she's closer she starts, to the ground than the she rest She starts of us. a little closer to the ground. <laughs> but, yeah, so, um, yeah, it's just not not a feasible rule. Yeah. But I like the question, yeah. Have and, you ever played against someone who's just, uh, they're just either lacking skill or just lack of consideration, and they're just spraying balls everywhere, and yeah. you don't know where it's going to go? I mean, that's a frightening. For sure. Not frightening because their skill level is so great, but just frightening because they're just so out of control. Yeah, and it, it happens more at the – the lower levels, I think Ben Johns mentioned that in my interview with him. Like he's more more scared to play with like me and other amateurs compared to other pros. Despite the differences in power, it's coming faster from the pros, but they're they're more accurate and yeah. less less chance of getting hit in the face. Most of the most of the accidental shots to the face come from ricochets in the pro levels. You know, like when Colin got hit, it was coming off of uh, Ben's paddle, right. He just shanked the ball and hit him right in the face. It happened when I was watching at Nationals. But um, it is unnerving, and people get rewarded for, you know, hitting the ball hard and body bagging. And if you're not at that skill level where you can precisely target shoulders, for example, and you've got a three-foot right. variance, you know, people are going to start getting hit in the face. So, again, safety glasses, highly recommended. I Frankly, I, I feel weird when I don't wear them now. Yeah. yeah I notice sure. you're wearing your Raya's pretty consistently. Yes. Thank you for pronouncing it correctly. I heard I heard from one of our commenters that we were pronouncing it. I was pronouncing it Ria before, but it is Raya. I went and looked it up. Okay. Great question, Brian Banks. Hit me up. Uh, DM me on Instagram. So John Q. Pickleball Instagram. I will get those mailed out to you. Pretty cool prize. Anything for next week? Uh, shoot, I forgot to reach out to people and ask. So nothing for next week, but we'll next get, week we'll, we'll get present. it back on the schedule. Yeah, very so nice. A, another great question came from Edward Smith four six eight two. Coming from a tennis background, when you look at pros that have powerful ground strokes, you see a lot more emphasis on technique and not a lot of discussion on racket technology. Maybe some on strings and tension, but mostly discussion is about the pro's technique generating the power. Mm. We see that with Jack Sock. He uses the pillow of the paddle of a paddle that uh, Selkirk Lux and gets plenty of power because of his technique. Do you think the pickleball discussion of power will start gravitating more toward technique than technology in the future? Also, isn't what Jack is doing taking advantage of the best of both worlds, a soft paddle that he can reset easily but yet generate all of the power he needs because of his technique? Wouldn't this be the idea to set up for it? Uh, wouldn't this be the ideal setup to try for others that feel they can generate power through technique? So I thought this is a really well thought out question and something that I haven't really thought about. Uh, I think that it's, it's a valid point in that Absolutely, tennis players are more focused on technique. It's, it's, it's so much harder to generate an accurate stroke in 
tennis than it is in pickleball. And uh, it just is like that. The paddles are the paddles. I've done it. I've come around 180 degrees. When I first started playing pickleball, I couldn't stop calling the paddle a racket. And now here I am calling tennis rackets paddles. But the racket is harder to swing, much heavier swing weight. It's further away from your body and your hand. And yeah, the stroke on in tennis, the strokes are just incredibly difficult. You see people practicing those for, for decades and still not mastering them. So I think that's a good point. Yeah, Eddie, what do you think of, of, of this question? You know, I I don't know where my technique stands up to others, but it's something that I always try to work on, um, getting more topspin, mm -hmm. for example. Right. Um, I've often thought maybe I should go see a tennis coach to work on my technique because it can only help generate more power in, in this case. But a lot of pickleball coaches don't do that. They are only doing strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, they're, they're doing, you know, dinks, they're doing drops, but they're not doing the ground stroke technique that personally, I think I could benefit from two hand sure. backhand as well. I do think, I mean, to his point that Jack Sock is playing with the Lux and generating plenty of power, a hundred percent, he's generating plenty of power with it. He is trying to switch to a, a poppier paddle to have more offensive options at the kitchen. That's where the, the Lux really does not excel, and that is in the arena of pop and offense at the kitchen. So Jack, yeah, he's first of all, he's a freak athlete. You know, whatever stroke he's using, amazing stroke, but he's also able to just generate wicked power. Just he is. He's, he's able to do that. So, yeah, when he's hitting baseline drives with the Lux, they're coming hotter than most other pro pickleball players playing with whatever paddles. But... Yeah, he's he's not able. I think he wants more offensive options. So he did try to switch over to the power air. What a jump! <laughs> That's a huge 180 jump, and and he went back to the lux just because he, yes, the pop is better, and he's able to generate and put away more balls and counters at the kitchen. But he wasn't able to to get that control that he he likes with the lux. I'm not saying Edward is suggesting this, but others have suggested that. Well, if Jack Sock can get by with the lux, then Perhaps, you know, we don't need more power in mm. paddles. But like you said, it's not really a fair comparison. Jack Sox, an elite athlete. Right. He's humongous. Yeah. Um, none of us are <laughs> physically <laughs> capable of, of keeping pace with him. Um, so you have to, if you're going to use Jack Sock as an example, compare him against Jack Sock with a different paddle. 100%. But yeah, that was an interesting question. Good thought experiment. And I think it's it's true that we we focus more on technology, paddle technology, than than technique and form. And you know maybe maybe it will become more balanced as we move into the future. Another great question was Mark Atwood six two four five. Do either of you have any exercises that target the mental part mm, of the game? This is definitely up your alley, John. <laughs> I found mindfulness is helping, but would really like to hear your thoughts. I just punch kittens. That's my cats. frustrations. <laughs> you know, I haven't published this yet, but uh, I'll publish the entire Ben Johns interview. I asked him about mental game, how important it is, what books he reads, what he does, mindfulness meditation. And, and yes, he thinks it's a very important part of the game, but he also says, said that, hey, if it's not broken, don't, don't try to fix it. He's like, the more I kind of read about you know, the mental game, the more issues arise that I didn't know were there. <laughs> so I might focus on those to my detriment. So he, you know, he's naturally good mentally when he's competing in pickleball. So he doesn't necessarily need to train that aspect of, of his game. And I've noticed that as I've been looking into and focusing more on the mental game, it does tend to lead to more peaks and valleys in mm. the game where where, you know, I get frustrated that I can't get my mental game in order and that leads to more frustration. And I realize, you know, my my mind is is chirping at me about, oh, you're doing all these things you shouldn't be doing. So it's the opposite effect of what what I want. So anyway, that's that's a nice little nugget from from Ben Johns. But for for me, um I do have some techniques. I I, I 
continually use. Um, first of all, if you have if you haven't read it yet, go read the mental game of the inner game of tennis, uh, which is a great book and it dovetails nicely with a lot of the mindfulness meditation techniques that that you use. But the simplest technique is is when you're feeling like you're not playing up to your potential on the court, when you're frustrated, when you just lost a point or hit it to the bottom of the net or six feet out. Try to calm your mind and get back into the present. And the best way to get back into the present is just focus on your breathing. And it's just you don't have to change necessarily change your the depth of your breath or breathe in. You can do that. But even just like focusing on how it feels, where you feel the breath coming in. Is it in your throat? Is it in your larynx and in, in your chest? You know, is, is the air cold or warm? That just the aspect of, of getting focused on your breath brings you back to the here and now and not some fairyland that your brain is trying to take you to with all of these narratives, all these thoughts that are, mm-hmm. you're attaching emotions to and taking you out of the, the moment and out of the game. So that's probably the easiest. So definitely in between points, I'm, I'm focusing on my breath. And during the point, one of the things that my old tennis coach told me was to focus on the seams of the ball as it's coming to you. Notice which way it's spinning. That's helpful in and out of itself, but it also helps you get back to the present. You can do that with a pickleball too. Notice which way, you know, look at the, focus on the balls and the holes in the ball and how fast it's spinning and just follow that ball as much as you can all the way to the paddle. Uh, and that gets you back into the present. Another fun technique that I like to do, is, this is a little more esoteric, so it's not quite as practical, but, but, Stop beating yourself up mentally. We all have these inner dialogues going on all the time. The best players in the world are the ones that talk to themselves the least, who think the least while they're playing a sport. And that's being, you know, in the zone. You're not, you, you don't have this mental dialogue going on when you're in the zone. You're just playing, reacting, and it's, it's a, you know, a glorious experience when, when you can do it. But one of the things that you'll notice with, and it's kind of funny, you know, it's kind of beat yourself up. Like you miss a point, you're like, John, for the, for the love, right? And, but start treating yourself a little nicely. Let your inner, inner dialogue be like you're talking to one of your best friends. Like I would never say the th- same things to you as I'm saying to myself. You know, I'm so much more brutal to myself sure. when I'm on the court. And one of the, one of the tricks in the inner, inner game of tennis was that you're always going to have inner dialogue. And it's good to notice things. Like if you miss a shot, you should probably make note, a mental note of it, of what you did wrong. But don't beat yourself up over it. Try to be more kind of neutral. Like pretend like your inner voice is more like a referee watching the point. The referee doesn't judge the person who hit a bad shot. It's like, this guy is horrible. He's just like, okay, that's an out ball. It's out by two feet. He might notice if, if it shanked the side of the paddle or whatever. So try to get you know, your inner dialogue to be more like a referee on a court, which is impartial and just notices the facts, you know. You can say to yourself, okay, I missed that ball. I understand why. Move on to the next point. Focus on your breathing and keep going. We should uh, invite a sports psychologist to the show at some point. That would be a lot of fun. fun. Yeah, for sure. Do you have any techniques, mental mental techniques you use besides punching kittens? (laughs) (laughs) The availability of kittens is always a factor. <laughs> no, not really. I, I try to think big picture mm-hmm. uh, and to know that I've seen all these patterns before. I've seen times when, you know, I, I can't serve it in or, you know, all my drives are going into the net or whatever. And I've also seen what happens on the other side of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's – everything is temporary. Things are going to change in the game. And I just try to think big picture to think, okay, yeah, been here before been out of here before and right. we're just going to get through this all things will pass yeah right. yeah but honestly i beat myself up just just like you do <laughs> it's impossible not to but yeah no, it's just another aspect of the game that i think is, is fun to, to think about and kind of analyze yeah. sometimes to my detriment to getting too analytical with. how are you with uh like getting feedback during gameplay from your partner yeah i love it yeah. as long as it's not like you really Crappy. Oh, <laughs> you really that yeah, definitely want to bleep that out. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, as long as it's not like if it's if it's delivered with good intentions, I think I'm I'm totally open for it. Yeah. How about you? Uh, I, 
I'm pretty sensitive, I would say. So it's on the delivery, I suppose. Yeah. And, and that's intention as well. When it's about strategy, I'm good with it. Uh -huh. When it's uh, about doing something different, I'm a little bit more critical of that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, anything that kind of takes your head out of the moment is, can be detrimental. So I'm really cautious. I don't think I've ever like given any tips other than strategy to a partner on the court. Like clearly – it's good to strategize. All right, target this person. All right, right. let's let's dink instead yep. of drive. Yep. Uh, but n yeah, I've never have I been like, you know, if if you if you close your paddle face a little more, you might not hit the yeah, ball ten feet out. Right. right. <laughs> like, that's that's probably crossing a line with most people. From a three L. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Well, that's all I had this week. Awesome. We'll uh, we'll get some more paddles out, hit some more, and do it all again. I'm looking forward to next week. Oh, yeah. We get to talk about the Yolas, and the Yola is being released Tuesday next week. So there was some stuff posted on, I think, either Instagram or Facebook from Yola. Mm -hmm. Just these generic paddle shapes in sort of pastel-looking colors. Hmm. Interesting. And, and people are commenting on the paddle shape and the colors that they're seeing. Yeah. I don't know that that's what Yola is actually releasing. Hmm. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, they they – Usually gone towards pretty muted, you know, black colors. Um, I don't know that we'll be seeing a, a pastel colorway from Yola. Well, in their top I, of the line. Series. I have an NDA and I'm colorblind, so I cannot cannot comment on the <laughs> pastel colors. But but uh, I did not see that that post. But everybody will find out soon enough. One week from today. Looking forward we'll see to those it. New awesome, Eddie. Well, it's been a great one. Thanks so much. You bet. Yeah. A lot of fun. Thanks, John. Hey.